Our scripture reading this week comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. I'll invite you to stand as you're able, out of reverence for the Gospels. Hear this word. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to, out to try them. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you have ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as you're seated, I'll invite you to pray with me this morning. Gracious God, as we open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might follow you fully, that we might engage in the change that you have called us to. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've entered into this new series as of last week we're calling Say What? Uh, because Jesus has many, many sayings throughout the Gospels that sometimes when we read them, at the end of them we go, Say what? What, what do you mean? Jesus, what are you trying to get at? I don't, I don't understand what you're trying to say and I don't really understand what it has to do with my life here and now. And so we've uh, we're attempting to unpack some of these stories and ask that question. Say, what? What does that mean to me right here, right now? And, and we've attempted to get at this because a lot of the sayings that Jesus had have become a part of our vernacular. We just use them in different places at different moments in our lives, not totally sure what Jesus was trying to say. And this isn't too uncommon. We do this with all sorts of phrases, with all sorts of different uh, parts of speech, with, with lots of different uh, sayings that we have in our lives, different colloquialisms. And so uh, we've been trying to get at this a little bit by uh, looking at some different colloquialisms that, that might be common in our, especially in our region in the South here, and just uh, using those a little bit to say, hey, the sayings of Jesus probably have a similar way about them in terms of what they have to say. So uh, today's phrase, I think, is, is going to be one that, that makes a lot of sense, that we, we've heard, but uh, that we don't always necessarily apply. And it's this. Now that boy's got more excuses than a dead horse has flies. <laughs> have you heard this one before? You ever heard that expression? I had neither. <laughs> it's Okay. But, uh, but I've been looking up, you know, like I said, I've been looking up these Southern colloquialisms, and this is one that came up, and I thought that was great. Uh, and I only use it this week because my daughter is on the kids' retreat, and if I was to talk about a dead horse in front of her, we wouldn't have a really good relationship, okay? So, so I feel like I can get away with it this week, but, but more excuses than a, flies, than a horse has flies, and that, that's a lot. I, and, and excuses are funny things. We all have them for all sorts of reasons, the story that we read today in the Gospel of Luke is, is a story about excuses. It's a story about all sorts of excuses, all sorts of different reasons that we can come up with not to do the very thing that we know we ought to do, but instead to do what it is that we want to do. The story begins in this way. Jesus is having a meal with uh, all of these Pharisees, with the leaders of the Pharisees, these, these really religious people, these people who have it all together, who, who have some means, who have some resources, and they host a dinner for Jesus, and they invite Jesus as their guest of honor because this new rabbi has been teaching in the community, and they want to hear what he has to say. So they bring him in, and, and he's talking to them, and he's sharing all sorts of wisdom but he's not sure that they're picking up on what he's putting down. 
He's not sure that they really get what he's saying. As as we talked about last week, he said things to these well-to-do people like, you shouldn't exalt yourself, but you should be humble. The humble will be exalted. The exalted will be humbled. And Jesus says this sort of thing. And at the beginning of our passage today, we hear one of the Pharisees essentially make a toast. Blessed are those who will eat the bread, the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying to Jesus is, hey, keep it going. We like what you're saying. Hear, hear. Let's hear more, Jesus. To which I think Jesus really thought to himself, they're not getting it. They're not hearing me. And so Jesus launches into a parable about a banquet, a great banquet that, that this person throws. And he invites all of, the, all of these people, very important people, many people, Jesus says in the parables. He invited many people. He, he made really nice invitations. And inside of them, he put an RSVP card. And he was so kind to self-address and stamp the return envelopes. This is, I mean, he went way out of his way to make sure that, that everybody knew that he really wanted them to be there and that there shouldn't be any barrier in the way. He sent them all out. But didn't get any RSVPs. Nobody responded, s'il vous plaît. My French isn't that good. <laughs> Nobody responded, which is, is funny because uh, social scientists tell us that RSVPs are on the decline in general in our culture. As a, as a cultural norm, RSVPs are just, we get less and less of them. People don't take time to respond. They don't take time to say, I'm going to be there. They don't take time to do that. Uh, on, on average, I read a stat the other day that said, uh, when you send out wedding invitations, your, your return, your RSVP rate, is about 40%. It's not very good, you know, because you carefully selected who you wanted to invite. You thought about them. You sent this invitation. It cost you money because those invitations cost a lot of money. You send them out, and you get about 40% back. Now, what's really interesting about, uh, about this is you get about 40% back, but on average, about 75% of the people who you invited to the wedding show up. There's a gap there. <laughs> a really expensive gap, if you've ever planned a wedding. And, and I think I know the reason. I, I think I have an idea as to why we don't RSVP to things. I think we've all got FOMO. Do you guys know what FOMO is? FOMO is fear of more options. Here's what we're worried about. We're worried that we're going to RSVP to something, and then we're going to have this commitment hanging out there, and something else might come along. We might say we're going to go to that wedding or to that party or to that event, and then somebody calls us up and says, I got two tickets to the game on Saturday. You want to go? Yes, I want to go, but I already committed to this other thing. And so we kind of set it to the side for a little while. And we forget about it. We don't RSVP. Well, luckily, this, this host was persistent. He really wanted people to come to his banquet it was really important that people come and eat this meal with him. And so he sent one of his servants out to, to all the people that he invited to, to tell them to come. It's time. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We got the meal is ready. I know you're not doing anything else. And so he goes to all the people's houses and, and he says, it's, it, the meal's ready. And one by one, they begin to make excuses. Oh, well, you know, I just bought this piece of property and I've got to go look at it. I'm really busy the rest of the week. And so today's, today's the only day that I can do it. So I'm gonna, I gotta go look at that, you know, I'm sorry. Goes to the next one. Oh, well, you know, I just bought all of these oxen and, and I gotta take them out and try them out. 
Can't do it tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm trying out the mules. <laughs> and, and you can't mix oxen and mules in the same day. It's just too much. I can't be there. He goes to another one and he says, oh, you know, I just recently got married, which is, is it's the biblical way of saying, the boss told me I can't go. <laughs> which, guys, let's just, look, can we just for a moment, like, if you don't want to go, just say you don't want to go, okay? Don't blame it on your wife, all right? Just, 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 be, just be, be honest about it, okay? It, these are terrible excuses, This is like the the New Testament equivalent of of calling to ask somebody on a date and they say, oh, you know, I've got to wash my hair. (laughs) Which has never worked out for me. (laughs) Not in a very long time. (laughs) And we read this story and we're like, why are they making excuses? It's a banquet. But we all make excuses, don't we? Excuses drive us crazy. As parents and employers, like people who uh, supervise other people or or your children, like these excuses drive you up a wall. You just want people to say yes or no, like I I did it or I didn't. When I ask my kids and I say, hey, I, I need you to go clean your room. This was really creative. One of them the other day said, you know, Dad, I was thinking, I could go clean my room, but I'm just going to mess it up again. And so then I'll, you'll have to ask me again to clean it up. And so what's the point, really? <laughs> or I'll say, hey, could one of you take the trash out? Oh, Dad, I am so tired from school today. I just don't know that I can walk all the way to the garbage can. And I want to get mad and I want to get frustrated and I want to be like, stop making excuses. But I make excuses too, all the time. I'm really great at excuses. I'm really great at coming up with reasons that I shouldn't do the things that I need to do. The very things that will make me better at life are the things that I have the most excuses for. You guys know that I, I, I enjoy working out. I've got a workout group that I meet with really early in the morning, a couple of days a week. And so you would think, that I might lose weight from time to time, but I don't, because here's what I do. I make this excuse in my head. I I say, well, I worked out this morning, so yeah, I can have two cinnamon rolls for breakfast. It offsets. That's my excuse, And, and, and I can run down them in all sorts of areas of my life. The excuses that I make, I make excuses. And I imagine, if you think about it for a minute, you do too. We all make excuses, not do the things that we probably ought to do. Here's what I think Jesus is trying to get at in this story. I I think Jesus says to these, these Pharisees, you've come up with all sorts of excuses why you don't really want to spend time with God. You want to play lip service to it and make it look like you're doing the things that God has called you to do, but you're not really investing in the poor. You're not caring about people. You're not spending personal time with God. You're not doing all of the things that God invites you to do to be the person that God dreams that you would be. And all of you have so many excuses as to why you won't. Come up with excuses all the time. As to why we can't spend time in prayer. Why we can't read God's word. Oh, well, you know, I started and then I got to Leviticus and it got weird. Whatever the reason is, we come up with excuses for why we can't be in a small group or a Sunday school class or a Bible study. Why we can't be in worship. Come up with excuses. We do the same things. Jesus is inviting us to the banquet. 
inviting us to feast on the very bread of life, inviting us to experience the kind of grace that changes our lives. We've got excuses. And here's what I want you to hear this morning. All of us have something in our lives that needs to change. And you can make excuses or you can make a change, but you can't do both. You just can't. You know it, I know it. We try to have it both ways and it never works out. These people make excuses for why they can't come to the banquet that has been set up just for them. But this host would not be deterred. He was having a banquet one way or another. So he sends his servant out into the town. He says, bring the blind and the, the lame and the beggars. Bring them all in. All of the people who wouldn't normally get invited to this sort of banquet, bring them in. And they come. Fascinating. Because you know what? They would have just as many excuses as those original people that were invited. In fact, they probably had better excuses. In this culture, it was totally unacceptable for the people who ended up coming to the banquet to come to the banquet. They didn't have the right clothes to wear. They weren't in the right social status. Some of them were, were blind and beggars. They, they, they weren't clean. They weren't ceremonial clean. There were hundreds of excuses that those people could have come up with to not go to the banquet. But they went. And the difference between the people who went to the banquet and the people who made excuses to not go to the banquet is that the people who ended up going were hungry for what the banquet had to offer. They were hungry enough to feast at the banquet. They were hungry enough to make a change in their lives that they were willing to overcome those excuses that they all had, that we all have. The feast. To come to the banquet. I love this story because it's, there's so many layers to it. Scholars think that one of the unique things about this is that Jesus says, you know, go into the town and and invite the lame and the poor, the blind. They think that he was talking about the people who were Jewish, of Jewish descent, who would have been a part of the same religious culture as the Pharisees that he was talking to, but, but who were pushed out by the practice of the religious people in this community. And then he, say, he goes one step further and he says, go outside the town, go to the Gentiles even, and bring them into the banquet. All the Pharisees should have seen exactly what Jesus was doing. Jesus is inviting the people who are hungry to be with him, who are hungry for a personal relationship with him, who are hungry to make a change in their lives, to overcome the excuses that we all have to come to the banquet. God dreams of the best version of you, one who's more loving, more gracious, more willing to serve, more willing to give of themselves. And the distance between God's dream and our reality is simply our excuses. As Jesus says, I've set a banquet for you. You are invited. Come and feast. I want power you to be the best version of yourself by eating the bread of life so that you might live life to the fullest. 
God has invited us all to a great banquet. But I'm struck by that last line. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. If all we've got are is our excuses, our reasons why we can't, why we shouldn't, why we don't have time, why we can't be that, why we can't give that, why we can't serve there, why we can't show up then, why we can't pause now, and we'll miss out on tasting the very bread of life. The good news this morning is that each of us is invited to a banquet. You know the better news? There's no RSVPs required. But there's also no excuses allowed. Got to get rid of those flies in our lives. rid of all of those excuses and lean into the grace and the power found in Jesus Christ who offers us the very words of life. May God empower us to overcome our excuses. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are so thankful that you have set a banquet before us, that you have given us the very bread of life through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would give us the strength to overcome all of our excuses so that we might be the person that you dreamed that we would be, so that we might be the best version of ourselves. God, we are here now. Give us your strength. Give us your courage. Equip us in this moment so that we might be hungry for you. We might come into this banquet beyond our excuses. God, if there are those here this morning who have never heard that they are invited to the table, that they are invited to be a part of this banquet, that they are invited to put their trust in you through your son, Jesus, God, we pray that they would say yes to that invitation today. That they would say yes to your son. God, help us to move past our excuses so that we might live life to the fullest. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.